I want Mama Bonner to come oh, while y'all can be seated. Y'all man, if we minister to y'all this morning, That's do y'all man, if the Holy Spirit minister to us this morning? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Let's give God another hand clap praise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. I will share, go by your head, be burned Beneath a load of guilt and shame, then the hands of Jesus touch me, and I. I'm no longer, no longer the same. Oh, since I met the blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, shall never cease to praise God. Oh, I'll shout it, I'll shout it, yeah. I'll shout it until eternity rolls. Oh, 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 he touched me. Yes, yes. Oh, Lord God touch me. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And oh the joy that floods my oh so I don't know about you but something something happened and right now Right now, 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 I know He touched me. Oh, yes. And He made me whole. He was there.
Amen. Amen. Thank um, the First Lady for allowing the Holy Spirit to use her. Very briefly and succinctly, turn in your Bible to Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 40, and we want to focus the majority of our discussion on verses 28 to 31, but the context which includes the entire chapter, we are going to talk about that and in terms of uh, what is stated in the latter part of the chapter, it is because of what is given at the beginning. May we all stand to honor the Word of God together. And I was so happy to see, uh, to have with us for this last legal holiday, Minister Jerry Pearson. Good to see him. He's come down, I think, with other uh, um, family members. They're leaving out tomorrow. But he's a part of our family now. Yeah, yeah. He, he's not a visitor. What it is, he's just away and he's just coming back. That's all. Amen. I'm reading the text from the New International Version, Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can phantom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men, they stumble and fall. But those in the King James that wait, in the NIV, those who hope in the Lord, will what? Renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So in this, the beautiful spoken word of our sovereign God, you might be seated. I want us to collect our thoughts and focus in on this particular direction. And I want to talk about faith walkers. Faith walkers. At the end here in the last verse he says, they will run and not get weary. They will walk and not be faint. And if you, I don't know how you feel about your Bible, but I write in all of my Bibles. Uh, the bottom, the top, the side, in the middle, between the verses, Wherever the Holy Spirit brings a thought to me, that's where I jot down that idea. So I have encased from verse 28 to verse 31, and I have underscored the word walk. Faith walkers. There's a song, or maybe a hymn, that says, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform indeed God does move 
and maybe the beauty of God's movement, he will not allow you and me to determine or to navigate the direction that he's going. You can't use a GPS for God. Can I repeat that again? You cannot use a GPS for God. For God, he laughs at our GPSs. The writer here, Isaiah, talks about walking. And if you think about it, walking is about the slowest mode of transportation that one can engage in. You can get in a jet plane, and you can jet across oceans to other parts unknown, to lands that you've never seen in just mere hours. One can get in a car, a very, let's say, powerful car, and you can speed down the interstate and you can go from city to city in relative minutes. But walking, there is nothing fast or jettisoned about walking. Of all of the ways of transportation, walking is the least glamorous. You can fly in luxury and comfort as well as you can drive in comfort if you got an updated model car that has that. But walking is not especially exhilarating, is not really that exciting, nor does walking require any special equipment. You don't have to go to Walmart and buy anything in order to walk. Maybe some good walking shoes, but beyond that, you don't have to spend a lot of money to equip you to walk. And not only that, you don't have to be an expert in walking procedures. Neither do you have to go and get a degree in walking. But out of all of these things, walking does require an entirely different set of abilities. And those abilities are this. Walking requires patience, Walking requires endurance. Walking requires determination and a resolute spirit. In the 40th chapter here, God spoke through Isaiah. Now you got to go back to the beginning of the chapter and come and read all the way down to the end of the chapter. The beginning of the chapter, God is telling his people, Israel, what's going to happen in the future. That because of their sins, God is going to rain judgment on them by allowing the Babylonian Empire to take them into captivity. Now this hasn't happened yet, this is future. And he is alerting them to the fact that they're gonna stay down there for 70 years. But he's not gonna forget them. He's not gonna leave them comfortless. He's not gonna leave them alone by themselves. So this 40th chapter of Isaiah it is a word of comfort, a word of encouragement, and a word of strength. And he uses interrogative questions that also imply the answer. And he tells them 
that I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. And I'm going to make certain that you will not be troubled anymore by enemies all around you. I'm going to bring you peace all around you. And it is as though God knew that some of them were skeptical and doubtful that this would happen. So what does God do? He exalts his sovereignty. In other words, he tells them who he is by character. Now they know this, but it's just like in our own Christian experience, in our own Christian journey, every so often God has to remind you and me of who he is and what he's done in our lives. And maybe that's the fallacy of sin in us that we forget easily. We celebrate quickly, but we forget easily. Let me move on. Amen? So he tells them, he said, now, I'm the one that's telling you this. And as if to say that somebody in a mystical way is asking the question, well, who are you? So God says, okay, you want to know who I am? I'm the God that spoke. And worlds came into being. I'm the God that no matter what men do to shape and to fashion an idol out of wood, that wood cannot compare with me because I can destroy the wood. I can destroy the craftsman who shaped and formed the wood. You want to know who I am? I'm the God that when I spoke, I flung billions of stars into my expanse of the blue ether. And not only did I speak and billions of stars bedeck my heaven, but I also gave a name to every one of those billions of stars. And to make that, or to fortify that, I haven't forgotten none of their names. Help me, Lord. I can remember each name that I have given each one of my stars that I have brought into existence. You want to know who I am? I'm the God that I make certain that each planet stays in its orbit. It doesn't move maybe a quarter of an inch. The earth doesn't collide with another planet. Every planet keeps in the orbit that I have told it to do. And each particular part of my universe functions according to my dictates. You want to know who I am, don't you? Let me see if I can give you some more credentials. These are my AKAs. I am a God that uh, you should have known about. I know you do. You should have heard about me, Israel. I know you do. But I am an everlasting God. My power is immense. There is no end to my power. My wisdom covers from eternity to eternity. You are so limited in your little bag of dust, you cannot phantom nor understand the depths of my mind. All you can do is just watch what I do, but you cannot figure out why I did it. You want to know who I am, Israel? I'm the one that's going to watch over you, even though you don't deserve it. But I want to let you know that even though you have sinned, you have paid double for your sin. And I'm not going to chastise you any longer. I'm going to bring you back, and you're going to have peace for the rest of your life. And then he comes into the latter part of chapter 40. Then he says, heaven, you heard, which the answer is implied in the question. 
you, 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 you ought to know about me. I'm the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. I don't get tired. I don't get weary. I don't faint. Because young men, they get tired. Even the, the greatest body builder. And in terms of the bulging muscles that he has, one day, sooner or later, those muscles are going to deteriorate and turn into Forever. And I want you to know that I will be here to keep you and to guide you. Amen? Amen. And then he says he uses what we call in terms of parallel description. And he says that, that those that wait on me. And he doesn't mean sitting down. Not talking about that a posture of sitting and becoming settlement and not doing anything. But if they wait on me, if you wait on me, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to renew your strength. And I'm going to give you the power like, and he uses the description and the figure of an eagle. An eagle is the strongest bird in God's kingdom. It can soar higher than any bird, and it also has sharp vision. So I'm going to give you eagle strength so that you are able to mount up over your problems, over your trouble, over your affliction, over your heartache. And I'm also going to give you peace that you will not get weary in your spirit. Your faith will not sag and fall apart. And I also want you to know that you don't have to try to keep up with me. Mm -mm. You don't need to get in no jet to catch me. You don't need to be a marathon runner to keep up with me. All you got to do is just walk. And if you walk with me, I will not allow you to faint. Amen? So that these words of encouragement are to walk us. But not just any walker. No, 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 no. Because you see, there are some people that walk that don't know the Lord. These are words of encouragement to those that walk by faith with God. Now, let, let, me, let me make certain that we are clear on that. These are faith walkers, and they walk by faith with God. Amen? Because if you don't walk by faith with God, you will faint. You will get tired. You will give up. You will commit suicide. You might blow, blow your brains out. You won't care in terms of what happens in your life. Now, as I was looking at this text, and I don't know, I can't explain it, but within the last couple of months, the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me in strange ways. He's been giving me messages before I even preached those messages. He gave me this message almost four, four months ago. I can't understand it, but I tell you one thing, it does thrill my soul. Now, I had to address this text because this text has some general principles of Scripture inherent in this text. And even though God is speaking to Israel, but yet there are divine principles that we can lift up out of this text that can bless us as followers of Christ as well as God bless his people. The way I address this text, I address it by asking two questions. And you can write this down. Question number one, if God says wait on him, how or what do I wait for? What do I wait for? And the second question is, how do I wait? 
If I got to wait on him, what am I waiting for? Or the last question is, how do I wait? What, 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 uh, what attitude should I wait in from that standpoint? Let's approach the first question. Why or what am I waiting for? Three things I want to propose here. Number one, we wait for our prayers to be answered. We wait for prayer to be answered. God, as we know in his word, he addresses prayer in three different modes. Yes, no, wait, or delay. Wait until I'm ready to give you the answer. Now, because we are impatient and we want to see God move quickly and rapidly, we become a little bit irritated and upset in our prayer if God doesn't answer that prayer within the time slot that we think he should answer that prayer. Sometimes, without being aware of it, in our spirits, we give God, let's say, maybe a couple of months or maybe a year or two, but beyond that, then we're saying, now, Lord, I know you, you, you know, you've had ample time to answer this prayer. You, you're God. you got all power. What's taking you so long? But what we don't understand is this. Because we are requesting something from God, then after we have released that prayer request, it's in his hands how he's going to respond to my prayer. still old. And if and we were talking about that in the study, that you, 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 you take one part that breaks down, put on a new part, and then later on another part breaks down. You can't stop the breakdown. You're not going to pray with me. You can't stop the breakdown. But you got to make certain that there are new parts to replace the old part. We go to a doctor called a mechanic, and that mechanic replaces those worn out parts on the car. We go to a physical doctor. He performs surgery to repair or to replace those parts in our bodies that have degenerated or that need attention. Well, God is also a mechanic, and he's a doctor. And he knows that in this day and time that we are in, everything that is erupting, that is exploding in our culture, the problem we know at the base is sin. But we also know this, that man today has a heart problem and a mind problem. God told his people in Ezekiel, he said, I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to give you what? A new mind. I'm going to take out that heart of sin and selfishness and that mind, the way that it thinks, and I'm going to give you my heart. All of the meetings, and let me say this, you may not agree, I'm not asking for a consensus now. I'm just giving you in terms of my own opinion here. 
all of the meetings politically and and uh, and community community wise that we have nothing wrong with them but it's not going to correct the heart of man as long as men are selfish corrupt greedy devilish have malice in their hearts no law can change a heart let me give you this this last illustration and I got to move on we thought well let's say the majority of we as a black race we thought that when the Lord put a black president in office people were cheering jumping rejoicing oh happy day when Jesus put Bahama in office Folk were saying, I didn't think that I'd ever live to see this happen. And uh, at that moment, we felt as though that a black president was the opiate, was the answer to all of the ills of America. The white presidents can't get it done. But put a black man in there, he gonna get it done. You gonna pray with me? I'm not asking for your political persuasion. I'm just asking you to follow this text. And we thought if a black man is in there, he's gonna straighten out this inequality of the rich and the poor and the have and the have nots. He's gonna get America together. Amen. But as the years ensued, we found out that whether a president is black, brown, polka dot, yellow, purple, gold, it don't matter about his color. He's still a man. And he is riddled with sin in terms of being selfish, in terms of trying to be as as uh, impartial as he can but sin won't allow you to be impartial sin will twist your mind and there were laws that were passed not by a white president help me lord but by a black president laws that impugn on the morality of america that undermine the ethical teachings of many that went before him. And now we are suffering the residue of that breakdown. And let me tell you what you are looking forward to in terms of November is worse than what you got leaving the office. Boy, it gets quiet when you start talking about political overtones and undertone. Don't nobody say nothing. But this is what God's word is all about. It's about in terms of how men live with one another and their purpose for interacting with one another. In other words, if I don't do it based on God's standard, then I'm going to what? destroy somebody else or I'm going to try to get even with somebody else or I'm going to try to be a taker and not a give out. Jesus Christ came to do what? One thing, to give. I have come that what? That they might have life and have life more abundantly. We wait for our prayers to be answered. We wait for his gifts of healing. And thirdly, we wait for our loved ones to come to faith in Jesus Christ. How many of you have been praying for somebody in your family for a long time to be saved? Raise your hand. I think most of us have. I've shared with you in my family, there are four names that stay on my spiritual hit list year-round. And, and, and uh, not too long ago, the enemy came in and, and, and uttered these words to me. 
if God is God, why is it, why is it taking him so long to change their hearts and to bring them to Jesus Christ. And the enemy said, won't you give up on them? They're not worth praying for. They're not worth prayer. Not God's grace. They ain't going to change. Leave them alone. Let God bring judgment and damnation to them. Let them face a Christless eternity. Amen. But then the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. Because there was a moment that you have forgotten in your own life when you were facing a Christless eternity. And God, uh, in his abundant, extending mercy over and over and over again, he didn't give up on you. Yes. 